Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Back in our Father's Word, this 13th chapter of Matthew is probably one of the, uh, if we were to say, as a linguist would say, a prime. This is a prime chapter. You either understand it or you won't understand any of Christ's parables. It has to do with the parable of the sower. And um, the word seed in the Greek and as much as the part of the seed that becomes the word or is the word of God changes to the Greek word in the 24th verse, sperma, which it, then it becomes inclusive of children also, meaning the children that the word attracts, the children that God's plan attracts. That's for you, you that have strong concordance, is it it'd do you well to take note of the change? And um, it, uh, because the meaning changes also to a deeper level. Check out the word seed and note the change in the 13th chapter following verse 24. Well, we're gonna pick it up at verse 18 today. Christ has spoken the parable, now he's going to explain it to the disciples or those that might have better ears to hear. And it reads as follows, with that word of wisdom from our Father in Yeshua's name. Chapter 13, verse 18, Matthew, let's go with it, it reads, Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. This is what I meant in that parable. 19, when anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, that's the king and his dominion, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart, his mind. This is he which receiveth seed by the wayside. Satan is always out there. That's who the wicked one is, of course. And he's always there to put doubt in your mind. You might hear the truth and want to check it out with some one verse revolving rev, and guess what he's going to say? Well, you want to listen to me, not the Word of God. All right, I'll do your interpreting for you. No, learn to study and think for yourself, or you're in a cult if somebody does your thinking for you or disallows you to think. Verse 20. But he that receiveth the seed into stony places, the same is he that heareth the word and a noun. This, is, this, is, this word a noun means immediately with joy receiveth it. Oh, I mean he hears it and he's so excited about it. Immediately hears it and it's ready to go. Verse 21, yet hath he not root in himself. We're not in the ground in himself. There's no depth there. But doeth for a while, for when tribulation or persecution ariseth, because, because of what? Because of the word. By and by, that's the same word as a noun in the Greek, it means immediately he is offended. He stumbles. You know, some people have to be, um, they feel they must please everyone. Well, you've got to realize many people follow Satan. You can't be a man pleaser. You've got to stand for something. And if you stand for something, especially truth, you're going to receive a little bit of persecution. Who cares? Okay. If, if someone is unlearned, you should worry not one iota about what they think or what conclusion they might draw. It doesn't matter because if you please men, men will take advantage of you. If you please God, he will bless you. Now, the choice is yours. This is a free world spiritually still yet, regardless of where you're at. You can think and pray whenever you want to. God can read your mind as if it's un, unsafe to say a prayer audibly. Just in your mind pray. 
God hears it. Still the less. Persecution is going to come to those that follow Christ. But we don't care. We can handle it. We have power all of our, over all of our enemy. And with the word of God, it's a sharp-edged sword, and we can cut them down like new mowing hay. It doesn't matter. Okay? We have the victory. We're in the right. Act like it. Okay? Don't let someone steal the word of God from you by inserting traditions of men. Verse 22. He also that receive a seed among the thorns, th this is those that get choked out, remember, is he that heareth the word. Hearing means he, he both hears it and understands, basically, okay? He hears the word, and the care of this world, this, the word age is attached, the, this world age, and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. Isn't it amazing? Do you think money helps you produce fruit? Not unless it's from God's blessings. If you've earned uh, that money by uh, ripping people off in the ways of the world, you become unfruitful in producing that that God would have you to and God's blessings go out the window and you are a nothing. That's why you never want to care too much about what a nothing says. What difference does it make? If you listen and take advice from nothings, pretty soon you're nothing yourself. Garbage in, garbage out. 23. But he that receiveth uh, received seed into the good ground. Now what was the seed again? Just to remind ourselves, the word of God, all right? Received it in good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it. You can see it clearly. Which also beareth fruit. He produces fruit. That's the whole purpose. If you don't produce fruit, you're fit for nothing, all right? And bringeth forth some in hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. God appreciates and gives the reward for whatever fruit you produce. That's the gifts he gave you, and he counts that as perfect. So never worry about the volume necessarily, because God knows what you're capable of handling, and that's what he gives you. Some he gives more, some less, but he still loves his children that produce fruit. He adds to them, he helps them, he blesses them, and it is a blessed event. Now, up to this word, uh, this verse 23, the word seed in the Greek has been a separate word from the word sperma that we pick up, particularly male sperm. Let's just tell it like it is. You have a strong concordance, check it out. From henceforth, meaning the word has brought by producing fruit people in. But God wants to let you know what a good work producing fruit, what can happen to it if the leader and the members thereof are not careful, if they're not on guard, if they are unlearned in the ways of this world age. World as it is utilized in, from here to the end of this chapter is cosmos. And it means this, this uh, particular governmental world in charge, okay? The ways of the world, wickedness, uh, free, uh, freedom of choice, and so forth, meaning it's on you. But now he goes to a little deeper teaching in parable. Verse 24, uh, chapter 13, and it reads, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven. Now, what, what is that now? It is the king and his dominion. It is heaven. Is likened unto a man which soweth good seed in his field. And I'll just tell you quite frankly, the field is the world. We'll learn that in just a moment or two. 25. And while men slept, I mean, the people went to sleep down on earth, all right, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. Now, tares, uh, as it is utilized in this geographical location, uh, if we look at horticulture, we know we're speaking of the Zawan. 
You know what? Zawan, as it is growing, looks exactly like wheat. You know, you would have to be quite experienced to be able to tell the difference in the blade. All right. But boy, you don't have any difference. You don't have any difficulty spotting the fruit. For wheat is a rich golden grain that we bake bread, bread of life, the real thing. But Zawan is black, it is bitter, it is poisonous. And so are the seed that was, the sperma that was planted uh, by the enemy. Verse 26. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, that's when you can tell the difference, then appeared the tares also. I mean, you can tell them by their fruit. By their fruit you shall know them. 27. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? Question. From whence then hath it tares? Question. Meaning what to you? You'd better be careful. You'd better be on guard. You might think that you've got a good flock. You might think it's all well. But the enemy is going to see that you have um, that that will not produce uh, fruit to your good. So you better learn what Christ wants you to do. Learn that in beginning a ministry, you better be on guard, all right? The enemy is going to take advantage of you if and only if you allow it. Verse 28, and he said unto them, an enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? Hey, we're ready. Let's go dig them out of there. We can get rid of them. 29. And he said, Nay, no, don't do that. Lest while ye gather up the tares, you rit up also the wheat with them. You're going to damage some innocent people or good produce in getting rid of the bad. Now that's just the way, and that holds true to this day. You have to be wiser than the serpent before you can move the snake. All right? Verse, uh, verse 30. Now, let both grow together until the harvest. This is God's instructions. You leave them alone. Let both grow until the harvest, and in the time of harvest, I, I repeat, Father speaking, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first. In other words, don't do this second. First, the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my, I repeat with emphasis, my barn, God's barn. Heaven's like that, and heaven is God's barn, all right? Uh, and um, so there you have, quite frankly, God through the Son letting you know that you got Kenites in this world, sons of Cain. Satan planted them. They're there. They're still here. And they will be to the harvest, which means all the way to the end of the millennium. Now, it's a little early maybe for some of you to grasp all of that from the parable because not everyone understands the parable. But I promise you before this lecture is over, Jesus himself is going to explain this, but not in parable form, but just telling you how it is, who it is, where it happened, and who did it. Your four W's. Now, have your thinking caps on. You gotta be, be open here. I don't care what traditions men might have taught you. Listen to the word of God and, and absorb it with understanding. Verse 31. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, the kingdom of heaven, in other words, my abode, myself being the king and my dominion of heaven, is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. Now, the, uh, the mustard seed, in fact, is the smallest of seeds man cultivates, basically. And uh, God's ministry is like that. 
if, if God blesses it, you may have ever so little when you first start. But God will so bless it that you will be lucky if you can keep up with it because it grows into a magnificent plant. There are, um, it's even called a tree in other places in the scripture. It grows. Uh, there are reports from this area that um, as research was done here that some of the wild mustard grows as high as a man on a horseback. Verse 32, which indeed is the least of all seeds, that is to say that man cultivates or in, and, but when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs and becometh a tree, so that the birds of the air come, birds of heaven, come and lodge in the branches thereof. Now this isn't clean birds, this is dirty birds, all right? What, what is Christ telling you? Every time that you start a ministry and it becomes successful, it grows, you're going to have people that are going to come and try to roost in it, that are going to dirty it up, if you allow it. This is why that you must maintain discipline to see that the seed that brings forth fruit is the Word of God. Not traditions of men, not some nutto's thoughts in the night, but God's Word. And if you can't train and discipline people to remain focused on God's Word, this is what will happen to you. It'll, it'll grow into something real nice and then here will come, Satan will send the dirty birds. And of course the ultimate naturally is that Satan's going to be kicked from heaven and try to land in the tree himself. I don't know, how good are you? That's why you've got to amount to something because you've got to draw the line. Verse 33, another parable spake he unto them. These parables all deliver a message. It could, in a sense, a warning but at the same time, he has foretold us all things, so there shouldn't be any surprises to you when the dirty bird tries to settle. Got it? Verse 33. Another parable spake he unto them, the kingdom of heaven, this is the king, his dominion in heaven, which also covers earth. You got it? Is like unto leaven when a wo which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole loaf was leaven. Now, and this works both ways. Leaven is usually symbolic, biblically speaking, in the Old Testament is sin. So it works both ways. You let a little bit of sin in and it'll, that sin will spread to the whole bunch. You let the dirty birds bring in a little bit of false teaching. I mean, if you're not careful, it'll spread throughout the whole thing. Meaning the analogy of uh, leaven, which is yeast, okay? Like, have you ever seen your mama make bread? She takes, uh, if she doesn't have a start, she takes a, a little cube of yeast and mixes it into the dough, and it must sit. And as it sits, that yeast will go through the whole loaf and it gets all puffed up. And if you're not careful, that's what happens to people, uh, especially if they get in a tradition that they think they're the only ones that have it. No, God give the word to everyone, okay? So don't, don't ever get yourself puffed up over the word. Right? But mainly in the good sense, in the good sense, a little leaven like that little mustard seed of truth a little bit of leaven being truth ultimately will spread through the whole loaf because we're going to scrape off the crud. We're going to bind the bundles and we're going to get rid of it to whereby Christianity will flood the whole loaf. Why? I've read the back of the book. I know we have the victory. All right. He said, those are parables to help you understand what will happen to you, be, being that he is teaching his disciples and the people, 
and what you can expect. And I've, I guarantee you it is God's word and it is true. It will happen exactly this way. If you begin to plant seeds of truth, you will find it to be true. Verse 34, all these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables. Because as you remember back in verse 10, it's not meant that everybody should understand. That being the reason he spoke in parables. And without a parable spake he not unto them. 35, listen carefully that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret, have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. And of course, he's, he's quoting here from Psalm 78, beginning with verse 2. You know, and you might make a, uh, it would be interesting that you make a home study of Psalm 78 because it has to do with the secret. But the most important thing is you need to do some work with that word that is translated foundation. Why was it kept secret? Well, what does this word foundation in the Greek mean? It's katabola. You have an entire appendix on it in your companion Bible. I believe it's Appendix 146. I'm pretty sure it is. I could be wrong, but I'm not usually. Uh, and it has to do with uh, the foundations of the world. The word katabol to its prime, and your strongs will verify this as well, take it to the prime, means the overthrow. It's been kept secret since what overthrow? Since the overthrow of Satan in the first earth age, Genesis 1 and uh, chapter 1, verses, verse 2, where the earth became void and without form, not was created that way. God doesn't create things waste. Man causes the waste because of Satan's influence. So it's important that you know these things have been kept secret since the overthrow, that is the overthrow of Satan as King Tyrus, as it is written in Ezekiel 28, and his penalty set thereof on, in verses 18 and 19, when wickedness came into the world. God intends and has a plan of salvation, just like that leaven being true salvation that's going to spread through the whole loaf that we can save. Some of it's unsavable. They're not salvageable. But they all, every last one, with the exception of Satan and his Nephilim, fallen angels, have the privilege of deciding, even the tares. Now, in as much as this has been kept secret from that time, what, what was it? When, when was the overthrow? First Earth Age. Why did God establish a new plan? Because a third of his children had followed Satan, and he had to either kill Satan, as he sentenced him to death, and his children. Well, God loves his children, and it was Satan's fault. So what did he do? He rather destroyed or caused to become tuhuvabu in the Hebrew tongue, the, the earth to become void and without form, and caused each soul to be born of woman, innocent of what happened, because all souls come from God, right? Stay with me. A little fast for you, put it on a shelf and leave it a while. So that the plan of salvation then would become a fact. And each person would have the opportunity to learn to love God or to follow the wicked one. It's your choice. That's the secret. And, you know, it's interesting, but um, the uh, word katabo, back to the prime, even means a sowing, all right? So you better pay attention to what the overthrow caused to be sown. You just read it concerning the tear, concerning the Kenite. Okay, now let's continue on, verse 36. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples
disciples, that's his students, came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. They didn't quite get it. I said, we want, we want you to explain that parable to us. Now, what's important about this and the way it's written, you know now that Christ is going to explain the parable to his disciples. Therefore, he will not be speaking in a parable. It will be the, there is no analogy being used, but he is explaining the analogy. He is explaining the parable whereby you are without excuse to know and to understand. Verse 37, he answered and said unto them, he that soweth the good seed is the son of man. He that sows the good seed is the Son of Man, meaning Anthropos, Christ in the flesh body, Messiah, come to earth, all right? 38. The field is the world. So don't let that be a mystery to you. We're talking about this cosmos, this world age. The good seed, the what now? The good seed are the children of the kingdom, all right? Those that obey God, love God, those that God planted here in a natural sense. But the tares are the children. Now you understand the change in the Greek word for seed. The children, the tares are the children of the wicked one, the offspring of the wicked one. 39, the enemy that sowed them is the devil. Now, is there some great mystery in that for you? Do you have eyes to see and ears to hear? Can you read? Can you follow a subject? Don't let someone spiritualize this away because Christ wasn't called the Son of God in this verse. It was Son of Man, Anthropos, flesh, right here. A reality, de jour to give it legal specifics. The harvest is the end of this cosmos, this world age, and the reapers are the angels. They're the ones that are going to do the reaping. Verse 40, as therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. That's the way it's going to happen. God is that consuming fire. And all that remain tares are going to be cast into that lake of fire as it is reported in Revelation 20 to be blotted out. Now, uh, does that mean that all the Kenites are going to burn in that? No, it doesn't. Because if a Kenite converts to loving the Father, to accepting Messiah, they're no longer a tear, but a child of God. So don't ever say that a Kenite cannot have salvation, because they can. For it is written that on the first day of the millennium, every knee will bow to Christ. And it is written more specifically in Revelation chapter 3, following verse 10. And the explanation of those that claim to be of our brother Judah, but are of the synagogue of Satan, meaning these tares, Kenites, will come and worship at your feet. Why? Because you are at the feet of Christ. So um, salvation is available for all. Verse 41, the Son of Man shall send forth his angels and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, praise God, and them which do iniquity. And that's the way it is. There's just not going to be any of that left in the eternity following the Lord's day. Do, do you think, um, you know, well, then I'm sure some are saying, well, are you saying that Jesus is teaching the serpent seed? Well, exactly. Satan's seed. Uh, I quoted from Revelation chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, where God himself said, this is the serpent's seed. He planted them, the sperma. And naturally, as it is written in the first epistle of John, 
Cain, who was of, that's progeny, the wicked one. There's no great mystery in that if you have eyes to see. And let me turn over to another gospel. Let's go to John chapter 8. And when many that claim to be of our brother Judah approached him, then um, he told them in verse 44 of the 8th chapter, he said, Ye are of your father the devil, the seed that the devil planted. And the lust of your father ye shall do. He was a murderer from the beginning. Now let me give you only one guess as to who the first murderer was in the beginning. You, you know, you don't have any choice. Every, every school child knows that Cain rose up and slew his brother and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. And when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. So, you know, it, it is amazing. I uh, received a letter just yesterday from some poor, uneducated little old lady. And she said, well, I finally caught you, or something to that effect. It ends up, you're the one verse, Charlie. Because you read John 8, 44 and said that the devil was their father. But if you had read verse 37, you would have found out that Abraham was their father. See, the poor ignorant thing doesn't know that Abraham in the Hebrew tongue means father of many ethnos, peoples. Why? Christ said, I know you say you are Abraham's children, but, you see, the little woman didn't watch her, the but, okay? But you did the deeds of your father. So you see, the unlearned continue on in ignorance. They don't want to learn. They, they look for ways in their uneducated, uh, uh, from the manuscripts way to try to find fault rather than listening to a teacher who is gifted from God. And um, so be that as it may, God bless her. Hey, she means well. She just doesn't know any better, all right? But you want to think, because Jesus said, I know you are of your father, Abraham. Why? Because Abraham is the father of all. That's what his name means. That's why God himself changed his name from Abram to Abraham. But why? Primarily because Christ would come through that strain and he would be the salvation to all, whoever you are. Okay? So be that as it may, God wants you to know that there is wickedness in this world and it has a, a seat and Satan still will take and he will consume whomever he can in this earth age. So can you begin to understand why Jesus would say in Mark, if you don't understand this parable, you're not gonna understand any of my parables? Because if you don't understand about the Kenite, as it is written in Revelation chapter 3, I quoted it a moment ago, verses 9 and 10, you can't have the key to David that unlocks the scriptures, so you're dead in the water. You're probably, well, does that mean I have to know all of the word of God to be saved? No. You just have to know, what is the key of David? Well, it's to, so that you keep your eyes on the true Christ and disallow the false one, Messiah, from deceiving you. Because you can't go around worshiping the false Messiah who's going to appear soon saying, I've come to rapture you home, baby. You know, and you jump into his arms and expect Christ to have you as a virgin bride? I don't think so. so. You see, it becomes a very important factor in salvation to be able to do God's work along with the freedom of the price he paid for you for salvation, that you amount to something. At whatever gift God gives you, use it. Stand for something. Because the simplicity in which Christ taught, if you just take a moment, relax, and listen, 
and be able to differentiate and understand he wasn't speaking a parable here following verse 37. He's explaining one, and a child can understand it. Don't ever now let some reverend come along and grab that out of your hand. Don't ever let some reverend come along and say, well, that's all spiritual, darling. No, it isn't. Anthropos and sperma. To separate from the parable and mythology, the, uh, the, the metaphor, and bring it right down to where the rubber meets the road, where a child can understand it. You got that? Don't let someone rob you of that. I don't care how big a handle the old boy might have on his pan, all right, or behind his name. Don't let him rob you of the rich, fertile mind that you possess, knowing there's more to God's Word than you have been taught, and maybe because you don't look at the simplicity in which Christ taught. All right, bless your hearts. Don't miss the next lecture. We're going to continue on with this. Listen a moment, won't you please?